Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks to Andrew and UKTFA for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Paul Fastenage, and I work for Wilmot Dixon as a BIM manager. Uh, I'm going to try and take my slot, uh, use my slot to give you a 20 minute overview of where we are as a contractor in terms of implementing BIM and how we use it. And hopefully, it should fit fairly seamlessly with uh, Roy's presentation. I thought I'd just start off with um, having a look at how <coughs> excuse me, um, contract contractors traditionally manage information at the moment. <coughs> and Wilma Dixon are no exception in this matter. We uh, still use the scale rule, as you can see on the top left there. Scale rule is still widely used. Uh, we love marking up drawings in the bottom left there uh, with red pen and then photocopying them and losing all our notes. We love emailing around different types of file format. Some you can open, some you can't. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Um, and top right, it's a big problem for us, is information and how we handle it. That top right is a picture of a tiling package that went out of our housing office a couple of years ago. There's nine packages there going to tender, and eight of those went in the bin. Information isn't autonomous, and it's unstructured. It's all over the place, and what we really need to do is try and join the dots up, and hopefully that's where BIM can help us. So what is BIM? Well, you've heard from, from Roy there, and the government's perspective of BIM, and how they're trying to implement it. For me, this is a large part of BIM, not totally it. It's information, and the real power in BIM is the I part, it's the data that Roy started to talk about with Kobe. Um, over the top of that, we've got the software like Revit or Tecla or any software, BIM software design package that we use to access that information. And because it's such a large database, using these software interfaces really helps us. And of course, we've got the pre pictures and all the other bits and pieces that go alongside it that perhaps we know well. So for contractor, and specifically for Wilmot Dixon, what is BIM? Well, we've added a second M onto it and called it Building Information Modeling and Management. That's because as a contractor, we're managing the process. We don't create our own models. Our design supply chain does that for us um, and design partners. So we're managing the process. And this jigsaw marks out how we're going to implement BIM up to 2016, starting at number one with understanding the client's needs and what they want primarily. That includes the government, of course. And moving around through design in two, time BIM in three, uh, cost BIM in four, sustainability in five. That's about where we are up to at the moment as a company. Uh, and then number six, integrating the supply chain is a very important one. And then later on, moving up to 2016, we're going to uh, look at site BIM and asset management and FM BIM. So, so far, uh, well, we've been around for about two years as a BIM team. We've looked at adopting clash avoidance, programming, cost and quantity BIM, and sustainability. The bottom two being the ones we're really focusing on in 2013. What have we been doing with those? Well, as I said, we don't actually create our own models, but we do use design managers and design coordination as part of the design meetings. So we've been taking different discipline models in several projects and bringing them together into a coordinated model. These actual models show our Birmingham City University project, um, which is the biggest project we've done to date, it's about 60 million. Um, and these models are actually captured from that process, bringing them together to the bottom model there and using it as part of design coordination. Once we've got a coordinated model, we can use it for st stuff like clash review. So this is where we bring different discipline models together and we can move inside the model and look at points where there's anomalies in the design. Um, this is a classic one up here. But it's actually a modeling error, not necessarily a design error. But where you've got SVPs going through a slab and there's been no hole cut for the slab. So stuff like that will get picked up and you can strike it out as a clash or as a known that it's okay to let it go. And this has helped speed up our design coordination process. We've also got 4D BIM. This is one that I've been focusing on. This is taking that coordinated model or uncoordinated model, depending on your, your stage and your design there, and linking that to program. Now, this takes traditional design programs at the moment through MS Project or Primavera and links it up to the program. It's not a new process. We've used uh, a software called Synchro Professional, which some of you might have heard of, but you can have plenty of other softwares out there to use. We've got five licenses in-house, which our planners are using. And it's a bit more of a flexible tool than Autodesk Navis works, which is another tool we use for design coordination. And this allows us to link it to program and program what we're going to do and plan delivery. Okay, so I always miss this bit, so I have to write myself a reminder. This is where I'm going to run the gauntlet a little bit and try and show you a 4D video. Yes, okay. So what we've got here is a 4D video 
made from an actual program. This is not design visualization or an architect game where we think this is how it will go. This is an actual 4D program for a delivery project done for our colleagues at the University of Salford, who I think you're going to hear from later on, uh, for their art centre. And it's linked to the model and then play to the client at tender situation so they can see how the project will be delivered and how we've managed to shave time off the program. Now, obviously, it's been glammed up a little bit and people call this Hollywood BIM, this part, but it helps communicate the idea better than a Gantt chart just being put on a table. Like I say, this is actually how we were going to build the project. And you can add stuff into this. You can add times and dates into it, time bars. This time bar has been taken out of this one, but that's very easy to do. And the basics of this... Um, anyone can do. The Hollywood side bit of it obviously has a bit of extra skill. But the basics of an animation like this to um, visualise what you're doing can be done by anyone. And you can always tie in with a nice walkthrough as well, of course. Got away with that. Okay, good. It's always running the gauntlet a little bit. So 4D BIM, one that I'm particularly interested in and looking at. Another one we're looking at, start to look at this year, is 5D BIM, and that's a very valuable one to a contractor and also the supply chain as well, which is extracting cost and quantities from the model. These don't have to be done in order to start being done 3D, 4D, 5D. You can jump straight to 5D BIM from your models if you want to. Um, and what we're looking at is a couple of softwares, two or three different software types, which we're trialing and extracting quantities from using the model and then taking that and plugging into our existing processes. And what we use at the moment is a software called Conquest, but it will export a simple XML file, which most quantity takeoff or estimate patches will use. So it plugs into nicely what we do now, is it's joining the dots up, not starting afresh. We can also use it to take out schedules. It's a bit of an extreme example, but this was the total linear pipe length in a housing project as a, a trial. And we can break those quantities down schedules now. There's also sustainability, another one I've started to look at recently. Uh, and again, as part of the dot, uh, dot joining up process, this is taking existing software that's used within the industry like IES or EDSL, if you've ever heard of those, uh, and taking the BIM aspects of it and linking up to the model, so joining the dots on those. And we'll talk about overheating earlier. You can link your Revit model, your BIM model, into overheating studies in IES. So what's this mean for timber frame construction? It's just a few thoughts I put down. Feel free to, to contradict me. It's a great opportunity for a standardized, quality-controlled, mass-produced product. It's a great way to work the supply chain and get the best efficiencies at what we do as a collaborative team, especially the I part of BIM, getting the information lined up. It's a good opportunity to show off the sustainability credentials of timber as a, man as a building product and manage the chain of custody. And it'll enable us as an industry and as a team to adapt to survive in the current economic climate. This is about digital manufacturing and digital prototyping for the industry, which is really something that's been lacking over the last few years. But it's not all about expensive software, far from it, in fact. It's about evolution. And I firmly believe that BIM can help us stop being, or potentially end up as the four-legged fish flapping around in the mud, and become down as the upright man or woman within the industry. BIM could be to you as little or as much as you want it to be. As I say, it's not about buying lots of expensive software. A lot of it's about the information management, the stuff we've been trying to do successfully or unsuccessfully for years. And it's about collaboration, working together as a team. It's a massive opportunity to take time and cost efficiencies for information and knowledge we're already producing. It's not just about the technology, it's as much about the people and the process. And above all, as I say, it requires collaboration and working together. And it's something that we've tried to do as an industry for a long, long time, but I believe BIM provides us the tools to be able to do that. If I was going to say one slide you should look at today that I've done, this is it. Culture Eats Strategy for Lunch. And uh, Peter Drucker said this. It applies to a lot of things, but it certainly applies to, to BIM and, and construction industry. And 
you can have the best guys, the best documents, the best publications on how to do BIM and how to use it, but ultimately, if you don't believe in it and you don't want to do it, then we're not going to succeed and we're going to be that four-legged fish in the mud. Um, and learning to use those skills and to embrace it will really help you.